A big welcome to Dr. Kyung Yi Pyun. Her scholarship focuses on the history of collecting, the reception of Asian art, the diaspora of Asian artists, and Asian American visual culture. She was a Leon Levy Fellow in the Center for the History of Collecting at the Frick Collection. She recently co edited Fashion, Identity, and Power in Modern Asia, a book which surveyed modernized dresses in the early 20th century. And she's working on a new book on school uniforms in East Asia. So today her talk is titled The Joy of Modern Life, Things to Avoid During the Pandemic. Thank you so much, Kyung Yi. Thank you so much, uh, Helen, for beautiful introduction. And uh, then I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, Helen and Alex, my colleague in History of Art Department, uh, for organizing this event. Uh, Globally Connected is important um, to bring awareness uh, of uh, international education and global connectedness in our lives. Uh, and earlier today, uh, like all of you, I also joined uh, a talk uh, uh, by Kenan, uh, organized by uh, Praveen and Emily uh, of social sciences. And that was uh, such an illuminating and painful story uh, that uh, we all um, have a deep thoughts uh, and you know, ideas about it. And anyhow, so my talk is uh, in contrast to, do, to earlier talk, it's very uplifting, <laughs> enjoyable. There are a lot of tips to enjoy Parisian life in New York City. So uh, I hope you enjoy my talk uh, today. And let me share my um, PowerPoint with you. And unlike my uh, usual uh, scholarly paper, um, I, I didn't write a script. Uh, I want you to see, um, you know, enjoy these visual images, this uh, um, today's talk. And I thank my student, Audrey, uh, who designed this wonderful poster as a Global Studies Fellow. That's a great program. Uh, is it Global Scholars or Global Studies Fellow? Uh, cultural anyhow, it's, Fellows. It's cultural Fellows, yes. It's a great <laughs> program. <laughs> anyhow, so did Parisians maintain a six-foot social distancing? And I intentionally chose this picture. So I'm going to analyze this beautiful image by Edouard Manet in a moment. But um, I want to remind you that we are globally connected even during the pandemic. Um, so uh, the second image, he, this is... Um, fashion designer Yuna Yang. Um, she has a boutique in garment district. Uh, she's like a high-end fashion designer. So in my class, Asian art and design, Asian American art and design, uh, we invited her via WebEx. And then uh, we had a lecture by her. And she's currently um, uh, located in Asia. So she joined uh, late at night. And it was early in the morning. And then um, so we, we got a group photo, so it's possible. <laughs> so now let me start uh, today's talk. Uh, I usually don't talk a lot about um, my original field of research, that is European Middle Ages. Uh, and I was a scholar of the Black Death. Do you know when the Black Death occurred? <laughs> 1350. Um, so I was talking to somebody that a lot of my artists who were active in 1330s through 1350s, they didn't recover. Um, so we don't have a full biography information, but I assume that many of them died during the pandemic. And that was pre-modern period, right? Middle of the um, 14th century. And then slowly artists recover their activities around the 1370s. We see some of those artists coming back to major productions or, you know, around the 1370s. So, um, you know, this pandemic gives me a lot of, um, uh, a lot of topics to think about and have my historical reflections. Uh, and for this particular event, uh, I want to talk about my study of the period in Paris. Uh, at the end of 1990s, I was a, um, uh, what is it? Um, my title was Predoctoral Fellow for the Center for Advanced Studies in Visual Art at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Um, so that was a great opportunity for me to live in Paris for about two years. So I was living uh, during September 11, actually. Uh, I briefly came back to New York and I witnessed the September 11 on television. Um, and then uh, my return to Paris was very much delayed because unexpectedly we had a September 11. So um, 
you know, at that time, airplanes were not operating on a regular schedule. So I went back sometime in middle of October. So anyhow, um, you know, this time uh, really reminds me of, you know, all those uh, um, terrible uh, historical moments that I went through, like uh, personally, right? And also uh, historically as a student of uh, the Black Death. But anyhow, um, so this image I recently discovered during my uh, art in New York class. And this was uh, uh, painted by Edward Manet. Um, he uh, painted this around 1873 when he was mingling with the Impressionists. Um, so um, as you can see, um, there are a lot of people, very crowded. Um, and this is uh, at the masked ball. It's sort of a festival, right? So people are wearing um, masks or you know, they disguise into some fun clothes and gentlemen are very well dressed. This is a typical dress for um, middle of the 19th century. Like people are really stylish at the time. And I'm going to explain to you why you needed to dress up every single day nicely. Uh, this is their tuxedo, right, for evening uh, occasions. So um, they came to this event and you can see that what this is a big no-no during the pandemic, right? <laughs> So um, you cannot have this kind of you know, packed crowd, uh, but this is what we should not be doing during the pandemic um, this time. Right? We have to keep the social distancing. So um, you, know, like you, you probably have your own reflections on the 19th century that um, the spectacle, like a spectacular sports or spectacular um, sceneries or spectacular gatherings or world fairs so that all started around the middle of the 19th century. And what we are witnessing these days is that we somehow rethink about those spectacular events that we used to enjoy. Uh, and then uh, we, we can still enjoy it, but uh, with some guidelines provided by CDC these days. Um, so this is interesting uh, work uh, because I also want you to pay a little bit of attention to this uh, provenance. Like uh, it was originally uh, purchased by uh, Louisine Havemeyer. She was uh, the wife of uh, Mr. Havemeyer who owned uh, Brooklyn Sugar Refinery. That is the predecessor of Domino Sugar. You still see the Domino Sugar uh, box in the supermarket, right? The yellow and the white and then the blue letters. Uh, so anyhow, Miss um, Havemeyer was an eccentric art collector. So people were not buying Impressionism very often uh, back then, uh, meaning early 20th century, but she was buying uh, Manet, Monet, or even Courbet, a lot of works acquired by um, Havemeyer family uh, are kept at the Metropolitan Museum. And you know those collections are unusual. Uh, but this particular one is now at the uh, National Gallery in Washington, DC. Um, and then, um, you know, it, it, we, we don't, I mean, I personally didn't study this work very often uh, because it's in DC. Uh, we are more drawn to New York collections, uh, but it's a great example to show you that how crowded that big opera is. But um, around the 1870s, opera is a new spectacular event that people would go to. So I'm going to explain a little bit more. So that's my centerpiece. So what about this? Do you think this is acceptable to keep the social distancing? What about this? So these are the kind of scenes that we see a lot um, in Impressionist collections, right? Uh, so. Uh, impressionist painters were called, usually called as painters of modern life, right? Like a mo modernity was emerging in the 19th century, and they usually uh, depicted um, those leisurely activities uh, of the late 19th century. Um, so impressionists uh, lived in the city, like a large city such as Paris, but then they also spent a lot of weekends or um, summer times uh, in the countryside. Um, so this lifestyle of town and country is well established in the 19th century. And I can also explain why. I, I have a more visual evidence to explain this new lifestyle of uh, town and country. Um, but anyhow, 
um, I mean, these are acceptable, right? <laughs> totally possible with six feet apart, social distancing, you can walk around and you can enjoy the beautiful umbrellas in a sunny day, right? Um, it's just for fun. But uh, going back to my stories of um, the modern life, uh, Paris is one of those birthplace of cafes, right? Venice or other um, Italian cities also had cafes, even as early as like 16th century on, you know, but um, Paris uh, around the 19th century was really um, center for uh, sort of social lives in cafe. And uh, if you uh, ever studied the French Revolution, we also know that coffee shop gossips were really widespread. And uh, some scholars uh, study all those gossips that were spread shortly before the French Revolution. Um, so uh, in Paris, there used to be sort of a cafes as early as the 18th century on. I mean, somebody should correct me. I'm not a scholar of early modern period, but um, you know, again, in the 19th century, it's pretty um, prevalent. You, you go to this kind of cafes, uh, it's near Palais Royale, um, so uh, people like to gather together. So back to my memory. <laughs> so um, while I was a, a doctoral student working on my dissertation on a French illuminated manuscript, um, I went to uh, these cafes a lot because I get uh, sort of American visitors, right? Like I have a friends from my graduate programs or, um, you know, international friends coming over. And then the easiest way, you know, easiest place to meet is here. Uh, so let me go back to a little bit uh, outside and then uh, let's talk about it. So do you remember which cafe I was showing? And you can type in, but um, have you been there? Many of you? I guess you're just listening, uh, not not really in front of your uh, computer. But uh, this is near Saint Germain des Prés, uh, and I like that neighborhood uh, more than the Louvre. Um, so that um, usually it's very easy to find. But uh, one warning that I can tell you is um, between the two, as most of you agree, uh, Cafe de Flore is more famous, right? And <laughs> because of search because of those French authors, this is a little bit more uh, famous, uh, but a, a few blocks down, Cafe du Mago, um, there are uh, wooden statues of two Chinese silk merchants inside. Uh, so that's why it's called Du Mago. Uh, anyhow, this is slightly less crowded. So um, what's interesting is my American friends want to meet Cafe de Flore, and my French friends usually want to meet me at uh, Le Du Mago. Uh, it, but they are only um, street away. Um, so with COVID, uh, usually Parisian tables are very tiny and you sit you know, across and you know, like a um, very intimate relationship. It's a pack to pack, right? Elbow to elbow. Uh, but with the COVID, I guess um, they are trying to maintain um, that health, you know, safety guidelines. So um, I haven't been to Paris for a few years. Um, so I wonder what would be like you know, in the new normal age. Uh, but anyhow, going back to this um, tourist map uh, of Paris, uh, 19th century, uh, Paris is uh, re, how can I say, re, reborn as a modern city. Um, so they started their big urban uh, planning, uh, like a big boulevard, as we understand, and then they are going to establish that arrondissement system, right, like uh, the quarter system, right, Cartier system. Um, and then um, the, you know, the, uh, you know, Le Dumago and Café de Flor, you know, on the uh, Boulevard Saint-Germain um, is in the south side. Uh, so the southern part, you know, like the northern side of uh, Paris was very much developed because Louvre is there and then Notre Dame de Paris is there. But uh, in the 19th century, um, Luxembourg Garden over here, it became public park, not the palace. Uh, and then Vigée d'Orsay, which used to be the, um, what is it, the train station, right? There was a train station um, and then, uh, Saint Germain de Pré in this area became a little bit more posh and uh, big mercantile areas. Um, and then I'm going to explain a little bit more about shops um, that, that, that are developing. Um, so it's on the southern side. Um, 
And then, uh, so Parisian people in the 19th century, they start to go to major public parks. And this is because uh, after the French Revolution, those palaces became public institutions, right? And then garden is also opening up for uh, public access. So that's why when you see impressionist painting, there are a lot of people in the garden. So um, it, it's sort of a, uh, just like a New Yorker. So you should be there uh, in order to see people. And you also dress up nicely because you will be seen by others. Um, so this is a Jiangdang that Tuileries near Louvre, uh, you know, museum currently, uh, and this is a nice place where even um, upper society people would go uh, on a nice weather. Uh, and you, I mean, this is also a discussion with my students. But why are parks always so crowded? Because there are not many uh, good good weathers, right? I mean, there are always a little bit of uh, raining or, you know, there are not many sunny days. So when the weather is nice, you quickly dress up nicely and go out and enjoy the beautiful weather. Um, so this is social life. And then there are gossips, right? Rumors are spread. And then maybe some romances. And then working class people, um, they would go to uh, Montmartre, like a northern part of uh, Paris. Um, so. Um, here, uh, they start to enjoy sort of a night entertainment. Uh, do you see those kind of gas lights in the background? So uh, it's not just during the daytime. Uh, you know, people can enjoy uh, nighttime. But again, this is a joy of modern life in large metropolis like Paris. In the countryside, you cannot have this much um, uh, night entertainment. Um, so uh, uh, this is like a young people. Uh, to get together, uh, and then they are more casually dressed, right? The, uh, uh, the, um, the straw hats, and then, you know, sort of well-dressed young, young men and women dancing together and enjoy beautiful times. So again, I, I was thinking, you know, during the pandemic, <laughs> this is again, we have to do something that postpone and, you know, not, 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 um, not so much encouraged. Um, and then um, the Impressionist painters, they painted a lot of outdoor scenes like this, a luncheon of the boating party. And um, you can see uh, the, the river behind them, right? You can see the sailboats here and among this crowd who, you know, can go out there and enjoy uh, probably um, the, the men uh, in this running shirt. Ah, I, I cannot talk right now. Oh, so sorry. Um, anyhow, so you can enjoy the beautiful scenery and uh, have a lunch together. Uh, and these are uh, on northern part of Seine River. I mean, northern part of Paris. And the way you get there is through a novel transportation. What would be a novel mode of transport transportation in the nineteenth century? Train. Yes. Steamboat, I mean steam engine, the the, the train. Um, so this this is Arujang Tueyu. You are going to see the location. Or Kurunuiek uh, is the name of this boathouse uh, plus restaurant. Uh, this is also on the Seine River. Um, so this painting and then the earlier uh, Edward Manet's opera painting, uh, they were all. Uh, it, acquired by, um, eventually, uh, by Louis Jean Habermeyer uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, and uh, Durand Fouyel is a famous art dealer at the time, and he loved the American collectors. <laughs> and I, I will show you one quote from him later on. Um, so, you know, like, uh, just in case to remind you, so Paris is here, and then this is Notre Dame de Paris, and then, um, you know, the Saint Germain de Pre, which I like very much, is located here. Uh, and then uh, now with the steam engine, uh, people can travel a little bit farther uh, to the north. Uh, so that you see Ile de la Jatte, this is where, you, you know, the Serra is famous a uh, Sunday afternoon on the island of Grand Jatte. Uh, that, that, you know, Grand Jatte is here, the small island on Seine River. And then Arjang Tueyu is where Lenoir, Monet, um, Manet, these people spent time together um, uh, for the weekend or for the summertime. Uh, it's right here. Uh, and then if you go a little bit uh, up there, eventually, um, Ile de la 
uh, Jack is here. Um, you can go further up, and this is a Giverny where uh, Monet maintained his uh, country house toward the later of his life, like the 1980s, 90s. He's mainly working from Giverny, and it's not very far from Rouen. Um, so uh, that's how he painted that. Uh, Rouen Cathedral, Monet's Rouen Cathedral on different uh, days, on different seasons. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Rouen. There is a beautiful late Gothic cathedral that Monet was painting. The right in front of it, there is a hotel. Uh, and then you can see the room where Monet stayed on a regular basis. So, um, so in order to go to this kind of uh, suburbs of uh, Paris, um, the train became very important mode of transportation. Um, so uh, impressionists, um, they paint uh, many beautiful scenes of uh, people like a young dressed Parisians enjoying beautiful time here and there. But I also want to mention that uh, Edouard Manet is from a notable family. Um, so uh, uh, this particular painting, uh, Lunch on the Grass, um, this is not any public park. This is uh, you know, a, a forest in Ile saint uh again, northern part of Seine. And this is uh, not very far from his own family state. Uh, so young people go to their public park, <laughs> and then uh, all the aristocratic people may go to their own family state. So this is also showing, uh, how can I say, like a changing mode of lifestyle, right? Like uh, things are becoming a little bit more democratic, public parks uh, converted from the royal palaces versus like uh, old aristocrats who still have their family state um, or hunting uh, lodges and so forth. Uh, but in order to enjoy the modern life, we also have to think about um, uh, the economic uh, growth that made these leisure activities possible, right? So um, uh, steam locomotives in the early uh, 19th century, and then 1860s when uh, Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. So uh, you know, children are still working for the factories, and then a large urban population who moved to the cities like uh, Paris or little, you know, other industrial towns, uh, they have to stay in these uh, boarding houses. They pay uh, for the bed um, and um, toxic environment uh, and so forth. So, uh, you know, in Impressionist painting, we only see, we usually see the beautiful uh, leisurely activities. And that's how I started my talk. But um, there are many uh, social concerns uh, related to the industrial development, right? Unprecedented machine age uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and then we are still living uh, its continuation. Uh, so the spectacles became important as uh, urban centers were developing in large uh, metropolis like this. So that um, uh, where to do will go to opera or musical entertainment. But um, other workers would go to this type of uh, dog fighting <laughs> kind of event. Like that's also a spectacular event or circuses. And we are Fashion Institute of Technology. So you should think about shopping, right? Like a shopping is also a great joy of a modern life. And I miss it so much too. Uh, so Grand Magazine, I know that age started. Uh, and do you recognize which department store this is? Maybe you will recognize this. Have you been there in the last uh, few bon years? Marche. Yes. Well, Sue is definitely a great shopper. <laughs> so Bon Marche um, built their uh, like you know this beautiful um, uh, boulevard, um, uh, you know, department store building around 1869. So this uh, you know um, old print images from 1870s. So going to a large department store, like a large store, Grand Magazine, uh, became a, again, spectacular event. You go there, not necessarily to buy things, but you go and see what's out there. And then this is where you can also see what the uh, popular trend is. Of course, you, you can also subscribe to fashion magazines, but you can also go there. I love the Bon Marche. <laughs> That's why I used to meet people in, Saint Germain de Pre area. Um, anyhow, so this is uh, Durand Fuyel, uh, the famous uh, gallerist. 
Um, so the reason I am talking about uh, these galleries is also changing lifestyle. Um, if you are aristocrats or noblemen uh, in the earlier uh, part of the 19th century, you commission work to a painter, right? You pay him. Uh, but in the late 19th century, I mean, there were galleries even earlier, but uh, you are now having um, gallery among these fashionable stores. Uh, and then people go and take a look and they buy a uh, painting. Um, so uh, Durand Fouillère said, the American public does not laugh, it buys. Without America, I would have been lost, ruined. After having bought so many Monet's and Renoir's, I mean, they were not sold very well at the time. <laughs> the two exhibitions in the US in 1886 saved me. The American public bought moderately, but thanks to the public, Monet and Renoir were able to leave. And after that, the French public followed the suit. So that's his uh, saying. Um, so um, he had uh, two locations uh, in Fi uh, uh, Rafit and Fi Pelletier, but they are both near Opera. So here, do, do you see Opera here? Um, so that's new um, spectacular um, entertainment, you know, where that entertainment takes place. And uh, that's really nice place to go out. Like these days in New York City, where would you go to, to see fashionable people and to be seen? I guess it used to be Soho, right? Or meatpacking district uh, in the past few years. Uh, but in Paris, it was opera. So you go to that district and then his uh, you know, gallery is located in that posh area. And then Gallery Lafayette and uh, Printemps department store is all around here. And then Gare saint Lajar, you know, that um, train station is not very far from here. Uh, it's somewhere near opera. So it's all together. Gare uh, saint Lazare is here. Um, so Impressionists spent a lot of time in this neighborhood. Um, so, uh, but I want to ask you this. So when we think about this virtual age, uh, I mean, you know, we, we are enjoying as an alternative mode, uh, like a Zoom or a Google Meet, uh, but the experience of going to the museum. Uh, so here, which one is close to the original Monet's painting, Impression Sunrise. Do you see the problem here? Unless you actually saw the Impression Sunrise in person and have some visual memory of it, you really can tell which is close. The format are the, okay. yeah. Which one I is think the Wikipedia the one is the closest. Wikipedia is uh, actually um sue is correct <laughs> you have a very good memory of it so what i'm saying is depending on the reproductions or depending on the digital images uh some are more bluish you know some are more yellowish or some are totally wrong you see what i'm saying like even the format is totally wrong uh, so um i mean this is also reproduction so i cannot tell you that it's it's authentic uh but it's, it's a little bit more greenish then bluish, that's what I want to say. So uh, this is the famous painting um, that uh, gave this group the name of Impressionism, uh, 1872. Uh, it was shown at the exhibition in 1874. So it's, it's around that uh, ages. But again, you know, uh, as painters of modern life, it's not just the neutral images of the sunset, the natural phenomenon, this is uh, um, the record of the industrial port. Uh, many of you can note this uh, smoke coming out of those steam boats uh, on the background. Um, so where is this painting? Have you ever seen it in person? Uh, it's in Musée Marmottin. So uh, I want to inspire you to go to Paris when the pandemic is over. <laughs> if you haven't seen it in person, right? you want to have a memory of it. Um, there was a big uh, like a, uh, news um, uh, advertisement uh, that it, uh, this painting uh, visits the uh, southern hemisphere of the globe. Uh, it was shown in Australia. So there was like, a, oh, it's the first time ever the painting travels to the southern hemisphere. So globally connected, right? Um, so I love Museum Amutang. Um, it has a lot of Monet and other Impressionist paintings. Um, so this is what Monet uh, was depicting um, So earlier. Uh, it was a sunrise impression. And then he also painted a similar scene at a later time. But uh, the largest cities were uh, very bustling and also 
uh, contaminated with the smoke. Uh, and this is again, you know, our concerns of sustainability. It's the first time ever with this industrial development so that they didn't really pay a lot of attention to uh, the damages that this modern machine age poses to us. Um, so this is a contemporary Louvre. It's in the northern part of uh, France, where Monet's family had a successful grocer business there. Um, so back to the ball of opera. I guess I'm, I'm finishing up soon. Um, this is old opera. Um, the new opera building was just completed around 1875-ish. And that is the current opera you probably visited. Um, and that new opera building is this. And uh, it was one of the most beautiful buildings at the time. Uh, and then uh, it took about 12, 13 years. Uh, and because of this monument, um, the area became uh, such a nice uh, walking district. I, how can I say it? Not really walking. Um, it's a promenade. You know, you, you go there to dress up uh, and to, to show yourself and to see other people. And there are a lot of fun things around this opera building. Um, and how many people can fit in? 2,000 people. So it's a spectacular entertainment. Uh, but opera is a relatively new um, entertainment in a way. Uh, in Milan, for example, or La Scala, uh, in the late 18th century, you already have a you know, pretty sufficient opera building with 2,000 people in. Uh, but you, there is no doubt that Parisian opera is much more beautiful, right? Impressive. Um, so after that is opened, then you see a lot of these uh, street views of avenues or boulevards near opera. So opera is here, and that's the Avenue de l'Opera. Uh, and the, the buildings that lined up with the trees, with the big boulevard, this is result of the urban development. As you know, like uh, um, the uh, Osman, Gong uh, Osman had a great vision for Paris. So even though there are a lot of resistance, he uh, put that uh, sort of a continuous facade of the building. And uh, as you know, like uh, it, it's a very neat and uh, not, you know, uh, organized on the facade. But once you go, go into this one of the buildings inside, it's like a small alley, right? Like there are two, three entrances going up to the north side of the building, south side of the building, um, and, and so forth. Uh, but it is such a nice place to, to visit. So a lot of Parisians, they dress up and come to Boulevard de Capucine or um, the Boulevard de Osma, uh, near Opera. This is all around the Opera. And then um, people, uh, so this is actual photographs of Boulevard de Capucine, um, but it's not very well organized. I mean, you have uh, cars, carriages, people, and some cars mixed all together, but you can see that people are very well dressed. They, you need a walking stick and walking all around. Um, and then uh, in that neighborhood, you also had the Gare saint Lazare. So from here, a lot of impressionists traveled to the northern part of Paris. I mean, uh, northern part of Paris, yeah, like a Seine River to go for a weekend, uh, not very long time, you know, but uh, these are all like images of modernity. So uh, Monet, for example, he's a in a way, eccentric, uh, who likes to paint <laughs> the images of uh, um, train stations with, uh, with uh, steam engines uh, and all these people waiting. And not only that, people like to walk uh, on top of the Gare saint Lajar, um train station, uh, and people spend some time, you know, going, looking over those trains. Um, so, this is the age of spectacular events. And the most important one is uh, the world expositions. Uh, and then if you go to world expositions, you not only look at industrial products, the way we go to uh, what is exposed these days, uh, but they also see uh, artworks. Um, and then uh, the, in order to have 1889 Paris World Exposition, uh, they were building uh, uh, Eiffel Tower. So you need uh, some impressive monument. This is what we are doing in our own time too, right? We all went to Highline Park and then spent hours and hours um, looking at people. And then we also had like a new Hudson Yard. Have you ever been to Vessel? Uh, climbed up the Vessel, like at that new Hudson Yard uh, shopping areas. 
Uh, so there are a lot of uh, parallel experiences from the late 19th century up to now. Uh, and also photography was, uh, was an emerging technology at the time. Um, so uh, impressionists have showed their works in this uh, Nadar, the photographer Nadar's studio. And this is right near Global de Capucine. So uh, again, uh, sort of a push place to visit. Um, so this is coming to an end. Um, so what would you do um, if you uh, didn't have all those uh, spectacular events? Previously, you should get invited. Um, so this is uh, uh, at the Louvre uh, when they had that annual art expositions. Um, you, you know, like personally, the king or the emperor should invite you to come. Otherwise, there is no public access. Um, so um, opening up those public institutions is a new mode of living in the 19th century. Uh, and obviously, there was a growing tension uh, among different social classes. Um, so there was a uh, 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 Paris Commune briefly uh, lasted in 1871. And then uh, Napoleon III, actually, um, he was dethroned, dethroned because uh, of uh, defeat at the Franco-Prussian War and then also because of the uh, Parisian Opera building, right? It was very expensive and it took longer than expected and people were very uh, unhappy. But once it was completed, it was a spectacular one. So my talk is almost over. Uh, and does anybody recognize what this place is? Anybody? Am I the only one who enjoys that sugary pastry? Do you see the macaron here? The macaron box here? This is called La Durée, L-A-D-U-R-E-E, -E, La Durée, like it's a French pastry. And uh, they have uh, locations in New York City too, and they are famous for their second empire style. And this is exactly the same style for the uh, Paris Opera, Opera Garnier the building. Uh, and then, um, so my memory, back to my memory. <laughs> so when I was a graduate student, when I was a graduate student, where I was living uh, was near Port, Port Saint-Denis, 10th arrondissement. It's near Gare du Nord. Uh, it's in the northern part of, it's in the, it's in the northern part of Paris. Um, and then I usually walk to my uh, Bibliothèque Nationale. Like, uh, this is the house, the estate of Cardinal Hichely at the time. So I would walk. walk if, if I walk, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Every day I walk to the bibliotheque to study. Uh, but uh, this is an old neighborhood. And at that time, I didn't know that this is sort of a garment district of Paris. Uh, late 1990s, I had a lot of wholesale clothing stores, usually on the second or third floor of these buildings. And they were usually managed by Chinese owners. So back then, I didn't know, you know, these uh, luxury labels were produced in China and, you know, sold in Europe or, or back and forth. But th there used to be a lot of those wholesale clothing stores. Um, so I, ne I never knew that I would work at FIT at the time. And then, um, so uh, among those large buildings, you have this uh, glass-roofed uh, passage. Uh, so that's uh, the novelty of the 19th century. Um, so you can avoid rain or cold weather. Uh, and Passage Brady is near Port Saint-Denis, and um, it became sort of a, a mini India town. <laughs> there are a lot of Indian restaurants under Passage Brady. So what I want to tell you is the neighborhood changes, right? Like uh, you, you don't have that original uh, residence for you know, hundreds, hundred years. People change. I mean, the neighborhood change with the newcomers. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, thank you for uh, enjoying my talk. And then uh, if there are students, I want to remind you that my department, History of Art, we have a study abroad program in Paris and in Rome. Uh, and we offer it every other year so that you can go both. Uh, so let me stop sharing. It's about 43. Um, and do you have any uh, question? Oh, so La Dire, uh, we have locations uh, in Soho. Obviously, everything is in Soho. <laughs> and then we also have one in near Free Collection, like near uh, 70th and Madison Avenue. Um, so there, there is another one. Um, it's a beautiful place to visit. You wouldn't regret. <laughs>
Um, and then what else? Um, yeah, so uh, going back to my previous uh, question, so um, the joy of modern life, uh, we can still enjoy it, but we should uh, continue it with responsibility, right? Like uh, it should be also egalitarian, not just for well-to-do, but but you know all social classes and then neighborhood changes. I mean, when I was living in Paris around 1999 and 2000, um, the main cities, especially the business district, district like a first, the second, third, the fourth arrondissement, up to tenth arrondissement, most of the shopkeepers were from Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and then there are a lot of ethnic restaurants. There is no Paris that we imagined in impressionist painting. It's like a big uh, historical anachronism. Uh, you cannot expect it, it, it. You know, it should look like 18th century Paris. There is no Marie Antoinette anymore. <laughs> like those posh Parisian ladies, they all live. Uh, Neuilly is a suburb uh, right outside the Lac de Triomphe, like uh, right outside the Triumphal Arch, or Versailles is very nice, like a neighborhood for sort of well-to-do, uh, you know, Parisian people. Uh, but in the city, it's like a cosmopolitan city, just like a New York, right? Like a, you, you don't see, how can I say, fifth generation Parisian anymore. <laughs> And I haven't been to Paris for more than a decade now. Um, I haven't been to that um, Espace Louis Vuitton, right? There are new art spaces. So uh, maybe there are other people who've been there. Uh, and I want to go there again when the pandemic is over. <laughs> <laughs> Any question? I mean, you know, I didn't know that I am the only one who's talking like this. I mean, you know, this one doesn't allow other people to join in during the presentation. But what's your beautiful memory of Paris? Nobody? You didn't spend many years in Paris? Like also, um, you know, can he I'll say yeah. something? It's Elaine. Oh. You know, it's interesting because my experience with Paris, there would be like maybe close to a decade before visits. And seeing it, you know, that way, the city has so transformed over the years. And one thing I always remember when I was a very young student and undergraduate there, and I'm going to I'm going to reveal I guess my age a bit, but I remember something very sad. I I couldn't understand. There were so many men who were crippled and missing like their legs, and I you know I I was very shocked by that. I didn't really understand, and I realized that they were like people who had been like my parents and my grandparents' age who had been in the war, and so I still saw this tail end of of Europe where these older people, you could see the suffering that had happened. I mean, it didn't stop the glory of Paris, you know, I mean, nothing stops that. But I mean, seeing it over these decades, um, it's just the first time I ever saw McDonald's in Paris, it was shocking, you know, it's like, um, so it, it's interesting to look back. I mean, you said you haven't been there in 10 years and when you go again, I'm sure it'll be, you know, transforming itself once again, you know. Right, so when I was living in Paris, um, we went to a lot of the Tunisian restaurants. <laughs> so yeah. I felt like a, I'm like a half, like a Moroccan word Tunisian. I, I didn't even know like a, what the big The meshwi, meshwi. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. um, but couscous, that's really delicious. And then mm -hmm. my particular neighborhood of 10th arrondissement, uh, there are famous, um, African regional cuisines. Um, mm -hmm. I was not that adventurous, so I didn't go, but there were like a, some like a Michelin, you know, starred restaurants, but they specialize like a West African cuisine versus East African cuisine, right? So mm -hmm. uh, Paris, you know, France is a big country with many colonies in the past, so that it's no longer, you know, like a France of that impressionist painters. Of course. <laughs> that, that was, uh, revelation and so anyhow I was traveling between Paris and New York every other year I mean every other month or so uh, so I was a transatlantic traveler and I missed that <laughs> yeah. um, okay. what? Oh, sorry so you go mm -hmm. so. No, no, <laughs> okay merci beaucoup um, Kyung -hee. one <laughs> question we are offering uh, courses in French also at FIT um, what was your experience with the language also when you were um, 
yeah. Paris at this time. Did you had um, encounters in French? Did you learn also French while you were there? I, of course, I, I am, I mean, I should not say fluent because I don't want somebody to ask me in French, but I, of course, I, I read and write and also talk, you know, in French. I, I went to Alliance Francaise. If there are students out there, Alliance Francaise is also located in New York City around what, 60th Street and Madison Avenue. So um, I went through their program in college. Um, so, um, I mean, they teach standard French. So I, I speak standard French, not regional French, right? Uh, and But then the funny thing is, again, it's not my first language, right? You always know the nervousness of speaking foreign languages. And then, so the La Dure, or I used to go to Maison de Chocolat, or there is a Pierre Hermé, like a great patissier in Paris, right? And then the French women are saying, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, je voudrais prendre ça, and je voudrais prendre, you know, like, uh, men feel like you know, very quietly, and then suddenly me speak French as a foreign language and say, je voudrais prendre. <laughs> that was very embarrassing, but um, it was a successful, right? Like I was able to see about 30 manuscripts that I have to study at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, um, and you know, I, fr French people like to record everything, right? It's a lot of paperwork. Maybe German do that too, Alex, right? <laughs> you know, I neatly wrote down all those, um, what the name, like a what is the manuscript numbers. I wrote all of those in me, French, and you know, like, um, so purpose were served, but, um, and French people wanted to speak English. So, I mean, this is a good, again, um, talk for students out there. And uh, I had um, language exchange group. So I went there. Uh, again, English is not even my first language. <laughs> so I was talking to them in English. And then, then they were talking to me in English. And then vice versa, we took like a 30 minutes speaking English, right? And then 30 minutes speaking in French. And uh, that was a good friendship. Uh, I had a dear friend. Um, she was a elementary school teacher at the time, um, Nasima, that was her name. Somehow I lost contact with her, but she was so nice. So we spent a lot of time in that Saint German <laughs> neighborhood. <laughs> and we went to Obong Makshe and they have a great food court. And, you know, I, I mean, single person, right? I, I didn't cook a lot. French people don't cook either. They are only their grandmothers cook. <laughs> we were saying, so, I mean, what are you cooking? Then? Oh, we go to grandmothers. <laughs> so anyhow, that was a really fun part. And things are a little slow. I really miss the New York. Um, you know, New York, uh, nothing slips, right? Like uh, you can order in or CVS or, you know, to and read open 24 hours. But then Paris, there are certain hours. Like in order to get my Wi-Fi, like uh, they have that French telecom and France telecom. They're very proud of France telecom, right? It took about four days to get Wi-Fi. And you can imagine how frustrated I am. So with all those frustration, the language improves. <laughs> I have to call and argue with them, you know, like, a, <laughs> pourquoi, you know, <laughs> and then what else? Um, and then, oh, so one tip that I want to give it to you is Louvre is always crowded. It's, it's always crowded even for French people, no matter when, it's always crowded. But what I learned is if you go after 3 p.m., it's really nice because all the group tourists, they are leaving. They have to go to the Pato Mushu. Do you see the, the boat on the Seine River? <laughs> they are going there for the nighttime. Um, so usually if you arrive at Louvre after 2 p.m., uh, you have a better luck of getting in with uh, less you know, waiting time. And then um, you can uh, enjoy like a one, one wing at a time. You can, you can never see all of them. You know, I always very ambitious that I want to go room, room, room to room, right? There are about 200 rooms or so, right? Without missing any single of them, right? But then I don't know whether I was successful, uh, but that was nice. And then, uh, if students are out there, you, you should really apply for, um, fellowships, uh, the particular fellowship I got as a graduate student, they gave me extra some thousand dollars for traveling. So I was able to go to Bordeaux or I went to, I went to Dijon, like a Dijon is a very important cultural hub uh, because uh, Burgundian uh, region had um, 
the French Royal Palaces. So uh, I had a tour along the Loire Valley. All of these paid by the fellowship. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> um, so um, it's a great time that I have all those uh, memories of uh, study abroad. But uh, for a student, I also want you to know that I spent some time in Rome. Uh, and then I spent extensive time in Florence. So I went to every single small town around Florence because I was taking Renaissance architecture class. Um, we even went to um, Benedictine monastery. Like usually they don't accept tourists. It's called San Miniato al Monte on top of Florence, overlooking the Florentine city. And then, so uh, we went in like, uh, so, you know, like uh, wear something conservative and then you don't act like the casual American, you know, you say politely, right? So we were all graduate students getting ready and then went there. And then the one thing that um, a, a monk in that monastery asked me was, so that was like a World Cup season. And then, and then he said, I, I, I never knew that monks would watch uh, soccer on television. And so I told him that I'm from South Korea and then, and then he said, Wow, you know, the soccer is really strong in South Korea. Wow. <laughs> that was surprising too. And then I went to the, um, that, what is it? Uh, Biblioteca Apostolica uh, Vaticana, you know, the Vatican Library. I went there for a week, every single day in order to see some manuscript. So that was experience too. Um, a lot of good things. So uh, if there are students again out there, art history is a great minor to join, right, Alex? Yeah. We certainly provide global perspectives. Yes, don't <laughs> agree. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you ever consider switching major uh, for your bachelor's degree, we have our history and museum professions, and that's an amazing program. And a lot of our students go Rome for one semester, right? In the not a lot, but you know, several of them always go to Rome to spend one semester there, and they learn Italian, and um, it's an invaluable opportunity. So I appreciate um, the International Programs Office uh, for organizing all of these. Um, and then thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you so much for giving us this wonderful talk. <laughs> and also making us so incredibly jealous that I'm probably going <laughs> to put myself to sleep crying. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I, I want to tell you a good thing. You can enjoy like a pseudo Parisian experience in New York City. We have mm -hmm. all Hermes, you know, like all these Parisian boutiques. Not that you are shopping there, but you can go there. <laughs> and then Pierre Hermé is an amazing uh, patissier, uh, and he has a shop at Sex Fifth Avenue. So um, you can get there, it's on Fifth Avenue. Uh, if you ever come, let me know. I live right behind Sex Fifth Avenue. <laughs> I can meet you there. <laughs> that um, sounds great. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, I hope this okay. uh, you know, uplifted your spirits a little bit. Uh, and then Matt is still open. Um, so you can go there and see Impressionist painting in person. That optical mm -hmm. stimulation is what you need in the age of virtual meetings. So it's totally different. Uh, on screen, it, it, you know, it does not really deliver that uh, optical sensation. When are you coming back to New York? I am in New York. I am not in Paris. Oh, I thought, why did I think you were? Good. Yeah, I am well, you're, here. <laughs> you're, cooped, you're cooped up like the rest of us. Yes, and then behind is like my background, it's a cafe, but it's not Cafe du Mago or Cafe de Flore. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> mm. Anyhow. All right. Thanks. Well, thanks again, Kyung Yi. It was a really wonderful talk. And for me, you helped me escape um, my, my desk <laughs> for the past almost hour. It was really wonderful. Thank you so much for all of the support for this series. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great night. Take care. Thanks, Kyung Yi.